Welcome back! And today is Wednesday, the last day of August, 31st of August, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you are watching from Asia, you are right now, 1st of September, 10.30 a.m. Singapore Asia Time. Welcome back. I'm so excited to join all of you today. <laughs> kind of funny because, you know, I was just returning back from a dinner with my classmates and you know, they wanted me to do the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> at the place where all of them are hanging out <laughs> very rowdy and I don't think I want to do it right there. So welcome back everybody. If you are watching live right now, I hope you can uh, say hello. Welcome back. Yay! And today we got something new, exciting to share with all of you. And I want to pay my greetings to Manfred. Yes, thank you for joining us. I also can see Elton. Happy Teacher's Day! <laughs> oh my gosh! I've totally forgotten that today is Teacher's Day. <laughs> and thank you very, very much, Elton. I see Wilson. Good evening. Jacqueline, good to see you again. And Hiram, yes. Tell us what happened. <laughs> Hiram wants to know the part two of condescending. And I can see Jeanette, Aris, Mac. Welcome to all of you. And before we get started... You know, uh, I got a kind of a wide array of drinks in my room. Today, I'll be opening this Canada Dry Ginger Ale. <laughs> I'm very thirsty right now. Just now, we had a little bit of a red wine. And good to see you, Catherine, Kelvin, uh, Daniel, and Shane. Wow. Wow, today is a full full show out. And, you know, I talk a bit of Pakwa news only. You all want to come back already. <laughs> Is that the reason why you guys are showing up in the live show right now? <laughs> so before we go into the serious stuff, hey, welcome back, Bakwan. You know, yesterday I talked about this word called condescending. I need to give you the part two, all right? So um, let's recap what happened in part one. Part one, someone was very, very condescending. Hey, Dizu, good to see you. <laughs> and CPK. Good to see you. So part one yesterday, uh, yeah, that was yesterday. Someone was very, very condescending to me in the class. And then uh, what was our three steps? What were the three steps we taken to handle someone who is condescending, right? Step one, we go Zen mode because typically the person who will be condescending to you, he, will, he or she will shock you in a moment that you find how could this person even do this at that moment in time? Totally stunned or shocked or surprised. So step one, Zen mode, just don't do anything about it. Step two, sleep over it, plan for the next day. <laughs> and step three, give it back to the person. So I'm going to continue from where we left off yesterday. I'm going to share with you there's a change of the tactic on step number three. So this is what I did this morning. I saw that person, went up to him, and I put my hands around his soldier's uh, shoulders, and I said this to him. Hey, you know, yesterday I was in my YouTube live streaming. I spent all my time talking about you. <laughs> and, you know, I decided to change the tactic because I also want to make sure that I'm not overly sensitive. And... I mean, I just open-minded. Maybe, you know, I'm perhaps I, I, I'm second-guessing myself. Am I, too over am I too sensitive to how he said those condescending words to me? I want to give him a chance. So I just merely say it one more time. I say, hey, you know what? Yesterday on my YouTube live stream, I spent all my time talking about you. Guess what's the response? His face totally turned upside down, as in really upside down. And the first response was, oh, was it positive or negative? <laughs> Boom! That kind of a verified that I think there's intent on his part to be condescending towards me. And I just laughed it off, went back to my seat, and I passed the burden back to him. And that's the way we should handle those who are condescending towards us 
without doing much damage. <laughs> Other than the fact the guy will be probably stress out and will, perhaps he might be or even be tuning in right now. <laughs> I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> All right. So, you know, um, and this is... Um, this is where I find my solace in all of you who show up right now to watch the part two. And I really don't like to get into this kind of a discussion, but I feel it is important that we need to protect ourselves from those who are very, very condescending towards us. All right. Tomorrow is going to be a great day. Tomorrow, the case study will be all about Singapore. And uh, you know what? Uh, I, I tried to send the Singapore Journal paper to those who are subscribed with us on Don't Stop Believing Trade Notification, unfortunately, I need to configure something in order to send a PDF file, right? So just be patient with me. I need to configure that later on. Then I'll file off that journal paper to you, okay? So that kind of a sum up how to handle someone who is condescending towards you. And I do a little tweak just to cross-verify, making sure that I'm not overly sensitive. But that answer itself speaks volume, all right? And and I know I'm at peace right now and um, just very, very happy to be back here. Tomorrow will be the final day at Harvard Business School. And then <laughs> we got three Bollywood stars. It's seriously, in my class, oh my gosh, the Indians that show up is they are like Bollywood actors, you know. They are like so handsome, so big. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what they do. They have... How do they have so much hair on their face? I don't understand. <laughs> the Chinese, no matter what we do, we cannot grow so much hair. <laughs> These guys are just filled with so much hair on the face, right? And three Bollywood stars will be throwing a party. I think that's going to be trouble tomorrow night. <laughs> and um, uh, maybe I need to postpone tomorrow night's YouTube live stream. Let me see if I can survive tomorrow night, all right? So I let my angels like, inform you later on uh, tomorrow. I, I'm, I'm not too sure, but it's going to be the final, final celebration before all of us depart and return back to our home country, work on what we learned in this Unit 2, the second year in our program at Harvard Business School, put into action. We got so many, many ideas, great, great ideas, and then year three, when we return back to campus in 2023, you know, we want to see how we progress, how far in our business from what we learn and we apply uh, the teachings from Harvard Business School. So this is a three-year program to kind of uh, prepare those of you who are owners or presidents of your own company. And I highly rated number one. This is the all-important program to take part and then let me tell you why. The most important factor is your fellow classmates. They make a difference. I mean, oh my gosh, <laughs> my classmates are like the who's who in the world of entrepreneurship. Literally the who's who. And very, very high profile people. But you know, when, when we talk to each other, it's, I'm so humbled by their humbleness. And that's really, really fascinating. And three weeks crammed together, we kind of built forever friendships. And... Any one of you who is thinking of taking up a business course, I highly recommend, please do not go anywhere else but show up at Harvard Business School. Do not go to MIT. Do not go to Stanford. <laughs> okay? So that's kind of a sum up. And with that in mind, here we go. We talk about a very, very important case study that's tomorrow on Singapore. And of course, the biggest news in Singapore, unfortunately, today, the biggest news, unfortunately, has to do with the word called cannabis. Holy moly. I mean, this is a very, very dangerous word. And um, I feel the need that we have to talk about it and not to evade the topic so that collectively, we as a country can move on and move past, all right? So let me show you what I'm about to show you and some of you already know what I'm about to show you and um, I give some thoughts about what has happened and then you decide how do you want to conclude on this mega, mega, mega news in Singapore for over the past two days, over the, I should say over the past 48 hours, all right? So here we go. 
And let me just switch over the screen right now. Dang! Here we go. The biggest news that has kind of crowded our media over the past 48 hours is none other than the fact that since independence 1965 until today, we have only produced a single Olympic gold medalist and his name is Joseph Schooling. We are so proud of him because he beat the unbeatable Michael Phelps and won us a gold medal. I mean, our entire country, we were just so elevated in spirit. Our morale was so high. And we say, wow, in a small population of 5.5 million people, we can produce an Olympic gold medalist. That is a major achievement. Unfortunately, this guy went to Hanoi and I, my guess is during the post-party celebration, probably someone or some, some people are circulating the cannabis for them to smoke around. I mean, I mean this kind of thing is kind of a very, very common in overseas. And for that moment of weakness, he picked up the cigarette, smoked the cannabis, and that's it. Somebody has probably backstab him or whistle blow on him and as a result he is right now suspended from swimming and he's not the only one there's another swimmer from Singapore both of them got caught and they are smoking cannabis not to enhance their swimming speed but I think I suspect I strongly suspect is in the post party celebration and you know such things goes around where where when, when you are a high celebrity, people intentionally will want to bring you down. And, and that's the reality of life. Unfortunately, he smoked it. He has to pay the price. And the worst part of it all, he's still a national serviceman. He most likely will be charged court-martial and probably spend about maybe 9 to 10 months in the detention barracks. So during my time in army, you know... Um, uh, I was kind of appointed the welfare officer of the detention barrack. We call it the, 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 the detention barrack because it actually means the military jail. Jail for offenders, right? So uh, my job as the welfare officer, <laughs> kind of interesting, is to visit the prison. And back then, the military prison culture was this, you know, I walk past them and most of them in the prison would be like, the whole body will be tattooed and they are super muscular because they got nothing to do. Every day, they'll just pump iron. They just pump, you know, do push-up, uh, flat on the floor, vertical on the floor. They just push up because they couldn't sleep and they got a lot of energy. They need to burn, a, burn off a lot of energy. And over time, the moment you walk into the prison, it's like, oh my God, this is a bunch of bodybuilders. So super fit, right? And they got tattoos all over. Now, during my time, there was a prison culture. And the culture goes this way. The moment they spotted an army officer walking into the prison, they will go like this. Good morning, sir! <laughs> I'm not joking. This is how they greet officers. It became a, what we call a detention barrack culture. My time, during my time. I'm not too sure whether right now he has changed or not. So that was the prison culture. And they will all start to stare at you. And the moment if you show any display of fear or weakness, oh my gosh, the prison will turn upside down. So I have to put on my, <laughs> my very, very stern face and look and stare back at them and say, carry on! <laughs> so a little bit sharing about prison culture because our dear Olympic swimmer, he is going to end up in that prison I'm talking about. Uh, I think he's not going to... I, I, I'm not thinking. I assume... I'm not assuming, sorry. I confirm he will not be given different treatment. He'll be treated equally like the rest. And that has always been a tradition in the army culture. So, what else can I say? The young man has made a mistake. He has apologized. And I feel that no one should further throw stones at him. In fact, we should rally around 
our fallen hero and give him the room and space to recover and soar like an eagle once again. And that's my view. I mean, he's very, very young. And I mean, overseas, the kind of culture out there is kind of crazy. People are smoking all kinds of things. And sometimes you are in that environment, you have peer pressure, and you just, in a moment of folly, you just break down. You, I mean, you... <laughs> Someone pass you a cigarette and, and you feel uncool, you just smoke it, that's it, pop, you're caught. Because there are jealous people around you who will take pictures and then report to the government. That's the price to pay for him as our national hero. So, how do you feel about this? Let me hear from our audience right here. And of course, of course all of you can have different feedback about this issue that's kind of a dominating our media for the past 48 hours. How do you feel about Joseph Schooling? I don't think I spelled his name correctly. Or I just, just forgive me about that. I think I... Um, oh, I think I spelled it correctly. So let me know how you feel. And uh, let me play some music and I drink with you. <laughs> Wow, everyone went silent. <laughs> now, if there's no response from the chat, it means that either number one, you don't realize that Singapore has produced an Olympic gold medalist, <laughs> or number two, you have not read the social media and found out that we have a so we have a gold medalist that smoked cannabis, <laughs> or what the heck is going on? How come none of you giving giving any feedback? Okay, I see the one from Altin. Proud that he came forward and admitted the mistake. Uh, Elton, I don't think he came forward. I strongly believe that someone whistled blow on him. I think he was uh, sabotage. And that's the piece that the media refused to write about. And my view is that he has been sabotaged. I don't think he would just take one path or two paths and then go to the government and say, hey, Mr. Government, I just smoked cannabis in Vietnam. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I, I think it's... Um, a case of a whistleblower, a, probably a fellow swimmer or what. And it is very, very sad, all right? So um, much as I speak, speak in a casual manner, but I can tell you, all of us who are, who are patriotic Singaporeans, we really feel a sense of, um, a sense of sadness for our national hero that has, has fallen down, all right? Uh, next over here, uh, Hiram, his humbleness speaks for him. He's still champion. Yes, he is un, un, undisputed champion that is the single only gold medalist in our country. Yes, that, that is the credit. Uh, James, let the law take the course. Uh, obviously, uh, the law must take the course because Singapore's success is that we are consistent in applying the law for all people rich and poor, right? So, uh, the law minister has spoken up today and and I'm um, very, very happy the law minister spoke up for him. The law will apply on him, but he he's basically encouraging all Singaporeans to give him a chance to restore himself. Manfred, the nation should move on. Yes, John, feeling sad for him. That's unfortunate. Jeanette, we all make mistakes and yes, he deserves our support and second chance. Yes, Jacqueline, we should not make judgment. And fully all Singaporeans should support him. Thank you. Dizu, we make mistakes in life and he did the right thing. Mark, penalty too harsh, not a big deal in North America, especially now legalized. Yes, it's, it is not, uh, maybe the right word is not about a big deal or small deal. The unfortunate word is that he's a national serviceman right now. His status is a soldier. He's not a civilian. He committed the offense when he was a full-time national serviceman in the army. The army given him leave. Uh, uh, that means to take uh, a few days of leave to go to Southeast Asia Games to compete in the Hanoi Sea Games. So he was swimming during the time 
when he is performing the role of a national serviceman. That compounds the offense. All right, not a civilian. All right, so, um, but that being said, <laughs> if you are a Singaporean and you're a civilian, you go overseas, you smoke cannabis, and you come back to the country, you are equally charged. <laughs> that is the law applied in our country. All right, so uh, just bear in mind on that. Uh, Kelvin, fair to all honest men and charged accordingly, no privilege. Yes. And during my time, uh, I was also charged in the military. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the punishment was very, very harsh, all right? So, you know, we go for our life round, life shooting, M16, pop, 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 pop. And what, what, do we do? what do we do at the end of the life firing? Everybody stand in one row, point the gun, check the barrel, and all of us shout, clear! That means no more bullets in the M16, right? And then the instructor will say, uh, pull the trigger. And everybody pull the trigger, and my, on my rifle, boom! <laughs> a bullet went off. <laughs> and uh, uh, because of that, I was charged in the military. <laughs> and the punishment was very, very harsh. Uh, they shave your head. And then you have to parade. Uh, and I was punished when I was going through office, officer cadet school. That made it even worse. Um because if you commit such an offense, you'll be kicked out of the school. But, you know, I was given a second chance and go through hell for, I remember, I think 14 days of hell. Shave your head like crazy and every night just got to do RP. All right, that was my time in the army. I, I enjoyed it a lot and looking back, um, kind of uh, prepared me for, <laughs> for what? For all the challenges in life. I mean, army, if you really go out all, all out to enjoy your tour of duty, they are teaching us really many, many valuable lessons. All right. So thank you all of you for contributing in the discourse. And, uh, you know, that's all I want to share about this. This part is it's not going to dent our, our reputation as a country. But more importantly is that how we rally around a fallen hero to give him the support so that he can stand up and start swimming for Singapore again. All right? Wow. 20, 23 minutes gone already. Thank you so much for your patience. So today we got a very, very interesting stock to look at. And let me set this up so that uh, we know how to handle, how do we handle a bad news that's befallen on a great, great stock, all right? So I want to prepare all of you for this. This is a great example for me for me to teach you guys about how to handle a stock that just spiked down. Okay? Ready? Here we go. Ding. Let's do it. Today we're going to look at NVIDIA. NVDA falls after US government restricts cheap sales to China. And I think the... The U.S.-China trade war is going to get worse and worse. Um, first of all, because we got a rising China that is going to show its force to the world. And then U.S., for every day of its delay on the part of U.S., and, and how do we define delay? Delay means that if, um, if U.S. goes out, to kind of uh, uh, show its presence, I should put it that way, show its presence in the Taiwan Straits, right? If they don't do that, every passing day, the China forces, the Chinese forces are going to become mightier and mightier. To a point in time, one day, no matter what the US is going to do, it doesn't count anymore. So that is the problem, all right? So from... From a war perspective, it translated into the economic perspective. So the economic perspective is defined as the U.S.-China trade war. And one of the areas that's most fiercely fought is the semiconductor chips. Because Beijing has came out a mandate that they want China to be the number one global semiconductor chip supplier in the world within the next 10 years. And the U.S. government is not going to sit back and say, okay, you carry on. No. They're going to create multiple hurdles 
to stop China from rising up. This is one great example. All right, so that's how we understand about NVIDIA. And we're going to go through the details, the substance of why and how they go about restricting chip sales to China. So here we go. The first important line is right here. The company, NVIDIA, said it was applying for license to continue some Chinese exports, but doesn't know whether the US government will grant an exemption. Okay? So I have this debate with a China Chinese, or let's say a Chinese from China. <laughs> All right. Who is pretty well connected and uh, he's, you know, he's my classmate at HBS Harvard Business School. And we have conversation about this, right? So from his perspective is that this will carry on. Both parties will hit, hit, hurt each other until one of them decides to stand down when he can't handle it anymore. And he's betting that China, uh, uh, he's betting that US will finally crack. All right? Because China uprising is so huge. Now, what is the real number that we are really talking about? How do you define China is so huge? All right? So we start off by putting out the framework. How huge is huge? And anyway, I, I like to ask simple questions like that. How huge is China huge, huge? All right? So let me give everybody the perspective. And then you know what we are really, really looking at. And then we can add on to the discussion, right? So all I did is this. This is the definition of huge, huge, huge. 1.4 billion population in China. And then if you look at United States, it's only... 329 million, or take it as 330, right? So I just literally take the number here, 1402 divided by 330. That's 4.2 times larger. That's how big China is, the definition of big, big, right? So let me write this down. This is defined as 4.2x. That's how big. China is. So if you look at this size, and say, holy moly, how much lovemaking can the Americans do to overtake Chinese? I don't think they can beat the Chinese in terms of population. <laughs> right? Because what I observe here in the US, they love to watch softball, football, and sit around, drink lots of beer, eat lots of hamburger and sausages, put on weight, how do you make love with such a big tummy? I don't understand. <laughs> All right. So the Chinese will keep producing more and more babies while the, 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 the birth rate of the Americans will just keep dropping because obesity is really a big problem here. As I move around the campus, I just observe. Just observe. Go out there, just observe. The average size of the American, the tummy is always so big. Oh my gosh. So this is where... There's no way for them to overtake in terms of the population count. Then, how do we frame the thesis for this NVIDIA argument? All right? So we come back right here. Ding, and here we go. Let's go back and uh, pull out the entire article. All right? And it's a very simple article. I just read to you the important parts right here. Oops. Hang on a minute. What did I do? More time. Okay. In a filing, NVIDIA says, said the US government told the company on August 26 about new license requirement for future exports to China, including Hong Kong, to reduce the risk that the products may be used by the Chinese military. That's it. Game over. You're not going to have exports from Micron, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, AMD, or even Taiwan Semiconductor. All right? If, they, they set up, if TSMC set up their plan in the US. So I think the strategy for TSMC better continue stay, stay put in Taiwan, right? So, but what is the main takeaway? The main takeaway is from here, I translate straight to the charts. Thing right here. 
This is scary. Okay? So bottom left, 2020. Bottom right is as of today. Right now, we give it some space. And already we can see on, on what? Holy moly. You can see on what? Oops. How to do this? Hang on. Huh? Uh, not very familiar. The stock price has already spiked down 6% today because of this announcement. It has dropped to 141. All right. So just remember 141. And right across here, we're going to plot a very important line. All right. So here we go. Uh, let me just do some switch over here. You will see this is a very important line. I call it a 150 line. Okay. Obviously, it's important. Why? How do we define important? Right over here. All these are the touch points, touch points, touch points, touch points, touch points, touch points. Including here, touch points, touch points, touch points, touching the 150. And this support line today has been broken because the stock price is trading at 141, below 150. So we are creating right now a new zone just for NVIDIA, right? So how are we going to do this exercise? Please watch. I'm going to kind of zoom in. And make sure I, I'm looking between extreme left and extreme right. All right? And I want to move up and down so that I could see more prices. And the moment I move up and down, I can see more prices. I found my red box. Ready? Here we go. The red box will always start at the top. The ceiling of the red box will be 150. And the bottom will be 125. Please write that down. Okay? So we got 125, 125, 150. This is the, the red box that NVIDIA is going to fall into it. It's already fallen into it because right now it's going to trade. Uh, tomorrow is going to trade at $141, which is $140 at the opening price. Now, if this is going to happen, it also means that I will move, move and look on the left-hand side. And you see, it's cutting many of the candles here. So anything between 125 and 150, that will be the zone the video is trading on. And that goes to my point number two. This is the moment in time you're going to pick up this great, great stock at a dirt cheap price. The company is not condemned. There's a change of policy. But the company is a great, great company. NVIDIA is a great, great company. All right? They will have to somehow navigate through this red sea zone, 125 to 150 for some time and try to find new blue ocean to sell their chips. They will straddle in this zone for quite some time. Thereby, my suggestion to you is that if you want to buy this stock, you buy at the bottom of the red box, 125. All right? And just place an order, 125, and just wait. If you get triggered at 125, congratulations. I will show you some of the trades I got triggered today, which is the dirt cheap price, all right? But the question is, when will the stock price get out of that red box once again? When will the stock price get out of the red box once again? That question really depends on when the parties between US and America, one of them will start to break down. I don't see this happening before 16 of October because as all of you know, 16 October is our new trigger date. Woohoo! What is the meaning of the new trigger date? Uh, if you still don't understand what I'm talking about, means you're not reading the news, please hang on tight with us or else you're going to miss the most important event in the history of China. And I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, the crowning ceremony of the great emperor, Xi Da Da. <laughs> okay, please write it down. And that's 16 of October where he has gone against the philosophy of Mao Zedong, he is going to re-elect himself forever. And that's why we call him the emperor. He is no longer the president. 
Okay? So the NVIDIA case will keep straddling along the red box until we go past October 16. That will be the norm. And by the way, what is October 16? <laughs> this is just uh, two weeks before 8 of November, which is the midterm election. All right? So I need you guys to be very, very sensitive to all these dates, all right? Midterm election this year for US is 8 of November. For the Chinese is 16 of October. Please go and remember these two days. And I'm going to reverse backwards from 8 of November, reverse back, boom, 16 of October, reverse back, we step into the month of September. Let me tell you September how important it is. Holy moly. And if you are not, not taking care of all these days, you're going to be blindsided, all right? So let me give you this right now. Hoo -hoo. Uh, today we are August, all right. September, let me give you the date for September. Here we go. Did they publish the date? Um... I think I found it. Here we go. Ding, ding. Check this out. We're going to reverse calculate backwards. 8 of November, come backwards. 16 of October. 8 of November, midterm. 16 of October is the crowning ceremony of the great emperor of China, Si Tata. And we come backwards to September. That's 13th of September. Here we go. Please write this down. All right. 13th of September, they will be announcing the inflation data, otherwise known as the Consumer Price Index. And here we go. Okay. But eight days after 13th of September is an even more important day. Holy moly. 8 plus 13, 21. What is 21 of September? All right. So here we go. I got to, oops, kind of uh, something wrong with my screen right here. Not too sure what's wrong with it. Okay, I'm back into action. We got one more date to capture. That is the um, 13 plus 8, 20, 21st of September. All right. And here we go. What's happening on the 21st of September? Check this out. No. Here we go. Ding, ding. And I hope you're writing all this down. And holy moly, 2022. We have right over here. I found it. The next FOMC meeting is on the 20th and 21st of September. But usually we detect the second day, which is 21st of September. And typically, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell will announce the interest rate hikes exactly 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 21st of September. So now we got four big events in front of us. Oh my gosh, this is very, very challenging. All right. The immediate from today moving to the future. The Bureau of Labor of Statistics inflation data will be out on uh, 21 minus 8. See my brain not working, Ray. Is it 13 of September? <laughs> then the second date is the 21st of uh, September, that will be the FOMC interest rate hike announcement. Then the third date will be the 16th of October, the crowning ceremony of the great emperor of China, <laughs> Xi Tata, all right? And then 8th of November will be the midterm election. And the final date, please write it down very, very carefully. And that is 25th of December, known as the Santa Claus Rally. So we've got five days this year, nerve-wracking, happening every month. And that's how we got to position ourselves for the big rally. I believe we have a rally coming up. 
because the pan up demand is so great here, all right? And, and I've done a little bit of grassroots check. People are spending money in the US, all right? It's, 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 it's crazy. It's crazy around here. So I got a disc nailed out already. And wow, I've spoken for 40 minutes already. <laughs> are you guys handling well so far? I need to drink some water. Oy! Are you alive? Let me drink some water right now. Then I go. Woo! Oh, there's only Mark Wong responding, you know, where's the rest? Uh? Dizzo responding. <laughs> and CK Leo. So how should we trade in the video? That's the big topic. Right? So I'm going to show you right now the data I'm looking at. And thank you so much, all of you responded. And I hope you have written the dates down. Uh, that's the big takeaway for today. But we're going to finish off with NVIDIA. And here we go. So I jump straight into understanding the data flow for NVIDIA and we jump into our software right now, okay? Here we go, ding! And let me just uh, 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 hide the chat overlay. This is NVIDIA. Universe stock purchase negative. Universe net core put purchase also negative. I go to step two. All right. So now I'm showing you all the software side of things. And we want to see the commitment from the lead investor, right? The lead investors really put in a lot of money. I mean, this is a serious bet. Look over here. 1.7 billion. 900 million, 800 million, 627 million, 553 million, 427 million, 369 million, coming from very big names right here Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Vanguard, HSBC, Goldman Sachs, State Street, and so on. Okay? This is on the buy side. Now, typically, I only look at the buy side, don't waste time. And the next thing, I want to look among my top 100. Oi? They are not so negative, you know? There's a positive. Of 34 million, which is a good sign, right? And then kind of scroll down. Who's the lead investor? Here we go. Katie Wood, Two Sigma, John Albert Overdeck, and F Frank Sands from Sands Capital Management. They are putting big money: 143 million, 268 million, and 310 million dollars. Now, obviously, on the other side of the scale, there are people who gave up. So off everything. No problem. Because on the right hand side of the red box, those who sold off is only how much? 73 million, 11 million, 3.2 million. But on the left hand side, look at the commitment of the purchase. 300 million, 268 million, 143 million. All right. And then we go on. Ding. Shareholder base. Let's look at the top shareholders. And. Here we go. This is uh, the founder of NVIDIA holding about $13.1 billion worth of his company stocks. And typically, I look at this column here. Are there any very drastic, dramatic, significant sale purchase event? No. It's very small, like 0 0.96, 3.05, 0 0.002, 2.56. This is very small sale. So the commitment for them holding on to the stocks remain very, very high. All right. I go to step three. And for step three, all the bad news came out already about restriction of sale to China. And I'm looking for any significant change of data. That means uh, who's buying big, who's selling small, and all that. So this is KD Wood, 143 million captured right here. And looks like the internal team, holy moly, they are all selling, man. Ding, 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 ding. They're all selling, all right? Anyone buying? Yes. Principal accounting officer bought $1.8 million. Okay. 
There's only one purchase. Any other purchase? Ooh, a whole bunch of directors right here. Their purchase price is $189. Today, if you buy $150 or $141, you have right now the insiders looking out for you. <laughs> because they'll protect their own price, which is $189, right? So I'm kind of happy I spotted this. Whole bunch of the directors right here all incentivized to keep the stock price up, right? So uh, just continue to scroll down. Any other exotic information? Nope. I'm done. I go to my final step, step four. That's technical analysis. And here we go. We got a big sale event here, 4.5 billion. And another big sale event right here, 842 million. All right. But have we reached the bottom of the price for us to pick it up really, really cheap? Now, I completed the four steps already. And I come back to the chart on the video and say, can I make a difference to the stock chart right now? All right. So again, I plot out the way I plot out in front of you just now, which is the 125 and the 150, which is represented by this red box. Okay. So let me paint, paint out three scenarios for you. Number one, those of you who are super confident, in fact, if you are trading at the mid-term range of this red box, right, somewhere in the middle. So you take 150 plus 125, that's 275 divided by 2. Right? That is your mid-range. Now that mid-range is what's going to happen tomorrow. You drop open at 140 and perhaps it's going to keep sliding down and bang, hit your middle range and that's it. You can buy at that price. Some of you say that, you know, teacher, that's the end of the road for NVIDIA the moment you close down China, right? China shuts you off. Now, not because China is shutting you off, but because of a US American policymaker decided to stop sale to China. Then you say, okay, no problem. Instead, I'll go in at 125. Right? So you have a choice. Go in between 150 and 125, number one. Choice number two, go in at 125. Or choice number three, don't do anything. Very simple, straightforward, all right? For me, I think this is a damn cheap stock right now. But the real question we should ask is, what is the percentage revenue contribution coming out of China on NVIDIA? If they say it's about 10%, this is a chicken feed, easy to solve. If they say it's like 60%, the video got more room to drop further down. But you will not go bankrupt. This is a great company. You just suffer headwinds in the near term. And then they have to find their footing, find any more blue ocean for them to sell their chips. That's my train of thoughts on this particular example, right? So I'm done done on the NVIDIA. I got one more thing to share with all of you and I'm really done done. How many of you know about this piece of information? Holy moly. Our number one advocate for Bitcoin has evaded paying tax. First of all, I'm not too sure what's the punishment in the US law. But of obviously, there's something going on wrong, wrong here in MicroStrategy as a company, right? So if you go down and read, there seemed to be an intentional attempt to defraud the tax department, IRS, right? So as I read through this, I mean, it's like there's someone, you know, complicit who conspired to help Michael Saylor to evade taxes somehow. So it's a serious problem, all right? So they're going to recover $100 million in unpaid taxes and penalties. Straight away for MicroStrategy, the stock price tank. And again, it's going to tank very, very low. Do we want to buy this particular stock or not, right? So you can read up all the article right here, but I'm going to switch once again to my chart. I want to know MSTR, which is the ticker symbol, how badly it went down. Okay? Not too bad. They only are expecting to drop about negative 3.56%, which is not too bad at all. I thought it's going to crash, crash, all right? So right now it's trading at 231. 
And we do not know how the how the case against Michael Saylor or MicroStrategy will evolve. You see this rock bottom price. 150. All right. If there's more bad news, you keep dropping, dropping, boom. At 150, you have to hold their stock and protect their price already. All right. That's my calculation. So today I've given you guys woo, quite a lot of uh, things to work on tonight. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, by the way, if you enjoy the session, can you let me know on the chat chat? Do you enjoy this session? Ding. Oof. You see, at this hour, 11.20, my heart, my head starts to spin again. I, I need to touch my bed already. <laughs> Something wrong about the weather here. I'm not too sure why around this time I kind of go Cinder Cinderella mood already. All right. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed the session. Well, only Kevin responded to me. Thank you very much, Kevin. Jia you, jia you. And who else? No one ready. Okay, that's it. Okay, we gotta see some more. Catherine, James, uh, Wani, Dizu. Good night, Cinderella. Yes. <laughs> I really feel like Cinderella. Around this time, you see my words start to slur already. <laughs> I need to touch my bed. And Wilson, CP, thank you very much, Jeanette. Okay, so I owe you guys two things. Number one, the Harvard Business School journal paper on Singapore, I want to send out to you guys. I need to configure something on, on the WhatsApp side of things, right? Number two, I need to fire off a trade on our mama stocks. As well as what I've gone through on NVIDIA. You do not know how I'm going to combine options with stocks for NVIDIA. Now, if you are interested to know how I'm going to do that, please join us at our Don't Stop Believing trade notification. All right? I'm going to show you and flash in front of you a QR code which you can scan, take picture on, and then you know our angels will let you know how to take part in our Don't Stop Believing trade notification. That's it for today. I hope you enjoy the session. Now, tomorrow... I'm not too sure what trouble I'll get into. <laughs> if there's any change of our live stream, my angels will inform all of you, okay? Thank you so, so, so much for watching today's session and may God bless all of you. Good night, everybody. Good night.